Are you at your point where you think you've hit your bottom or maybe that there's just no way you're ever going to feel like things can change? I was like that. I really was. And I want you to know, my name is Bromo, by the way. I want you to know that there is a way out. Please join us for my podcasts. When you make decisions for your company, you look for the no-brainers. And if you have a lot of mailing to do, Stamps.com is the ultimate no-brainer. It streamlines your processes to make your business more efficient, which makes you less busy. Mail checks, invoices, legal documents, and everything you need to keep your business running with Stamps.com. Seamlessly connect with every major marketplace and shopping cart. Schedule package pickups and see your cheapest and fastest shipping options from different carriers. With rates up to 89% off USPS and UPS rates. And with the Stamps.com mobile app, you can take care of mailing and shipping wherever you are. Make the same no-brainer decision as over 1 million other businesses with Stamps.com. Sign up with code PROGRAM for a 4-week trial, plus free postage and a free digital scale. No long-term commitments or contracts. That's Stamps.com. Code PROGRAM. Hey, all right. My name is Bromo. This is There Is A Way Out. This is episode number 13. And here's the cool thing. I'm almost done with my story. (laughs) I am. Today is the 30th of January here in Bismarck. We could see record high temps. We could be at like 55 degrees. And I'm telling you, this time of year, when that happens, you will see people out on bicycles and rollerblading. Well, maybe I won't say rollerblading because there's still... Uh, some parts of snow on the ground. I mean, there's in a lot of areas, but it's like everybody goes out and flies a kite. <laughs> uh, maybe not, but it, but the thing is, they're not. We're not used to that kind of warmer temps at this uh, part of the winter season. I know it's still relatively early. Like my engineer was telling me, we could see snow sometimes as late as May. And I believe it. I do. There is a way out. My name is Bromo again. My sobriety date is two seventeen oh nine. Again, I am not an expert. Uh, I'm not, I don't have any qualifications except for just life experience. My hope, again, from always when I started doing these, is that someone who may feel they either drink or use too much, whatever kind of addiction they're in, or they have a friend, family member, maybe they want to give a listen to uh, my podcast and realize that there is a way out. I felt the same way years and years and years ago when I was in my bottom uh, that I would never be able to pull out, that I would never even go a day without drinking. And, you know, through uh, friends and AA and strength and just uh, striving forward, I've realized a much better life, a much better life than ever, even when I was drinking. And I will admit some of those drinking days were a blast. However, do you think I would ever go back to that? Well, I could slip and fall. We all could. And that's one of the reasons why we use our strength to keep track of each other. My sponsor, his name is Dave. And uh, he's awesome. He lives in San Diego. Uh, My best friend, Dave, he and I had not spoken for quite a while after I had really uh, deserted the show by my own Uh, selfishness and weakness in drinking. And when I needed to get away and get help, one of the coolest things was when I was in Pathfinders and I was away from the show for quite a while now. It was right around Christmas time. He actually let me go on the air and tell everybody what was going on because in my absence, when I was gone, he protected me in so many different ways. He did not let people tell. uh, He did not let people tell. He did not tell people. Do you ever do that? Do you ever uh, get your sentences mixed up? He did not tell um, listeners of the show where I went. And, 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 you know, I'm not trying to brag or anything, but a lot of people were wondering what happened. All of a sudden, I disappeared. And he kept that secret. He kept that private. And then uh, one day, their last show, I believe, right before they went on vacation, he put me on. and, And I told everybody that I was at Pathfinders and I was staying sober, and it was a real awesome treat. It was sad for me because I had been on that show so many times before, but it was a a sign of moving forward desperately 
is what I and that's what I was doing. I wanted to say a couple things that I didn't touch upon when I um, when I realized with a brick hitting my head that I needed to get my act together after Rob and his uh, unfortunate um, suicide. When I when I heard the news from that and I realized that single second that I needed to move forward. I did, and it took me a little bit before I got a sponsor uh, that I was comfortable with, and then when I remained with that sponsor and I did the steps, I started listening to people at the podium. Never before did I really show any, I mean, hardly, hardly ever did I show any interest of anybody who would go up to the podium and speak. But now suddenly a light bulb that had clicked on in my head, I started listening to everybody who went up to share didn't matter if they had 30 years sober or 30 days sober. I listened, I listened and I started realizing that we all, we all have the same thing in common. We're all hurting and we're all getting, um, our lives trying to get back in order again. And we all have that common goal of, sobriety and we want our journey to continue and we need each other. I never had thought that before and I forgot to mention that, but that was one of the coolest things that, that I started realizing that I enjoyed going to meetings. Now it was, uh, it's hard to explain, but I know that, uh, the, that you can understand this. It was kind of like going someplace that you're so, you feel so comfortable right away. Didn't even matter if I was walking into a room for the very first time. Uh, I could go to any city and go to an AA meeting and feel at home. And I can look around and see the people that are being tormented, see the people that are recovering, see the people that are first timers, see the old timers and have people come up and say hi, introducing themselves. It's a brotherhood, sisterhood that's really incredible. And I, uh, it's one of the things I love so much about our program and about my lifestyle now is that um, I'm no longer embarrassed. And it took me a while before I was able to say that, but I'm no longer, I haven't been embarrassed in a long, long time to tell people who I am, how long I've been sober. I'll show you my tattoo if you ask me. (laughs) You you see it. Um, The steps, the 12 steps. Obviously, the hardest step is to make sure, and you'll know it, when you 100% surrender, 100%. And uh, that comes with time. As you've heard my story, you've heard me relapse, you've heard all the stories where I I, I was lying and faking and, and, and telling everybody that I had it made. I didn't have it made. But once again, it's part of the process. And you'll hear people say that, relapse, part of the process. A lot of people don't like that, that term. And I understand that quite a bit. I do. Um, some people think it's a lazy term of, or an excuse to say, yeah, I can go out and get loaded or I can go out and get drunk. And then I'll start, uh, I'll start on that sobriety journey again. Because remember, it's part of the process. It is. It is part of the process. However, um, once you stay sober, and you figure out your own pattern and your own ways of going about it, and you you enjoy the lifestyle that comes to staying sober as far as people start to look at you differently. People start to trust you slowly. Some people may never trust you, and that's another one of the steps. I believe it's eight. Uh, I'm probably wrong. Uh, but I believe it's number eight where it's time to make amends to people that you have done wrong. Um, and when you go with your sponsor and stuff and you, you, uh, you write down, uh, certain things. And I will tell you about that a little later on as well. It's, uh, it's a process of going to each person that uh, you feel you've harmed and you want to make amends to them. And that's very important. You don't want to try to leave anybody out, especially the ones that you know for sure you've made harm to. Uh, 
when you do that, of course, not everyone's going to take you back with open arms. And that's one of the things that I learned. And one of the things that I found out by experience. And one of the amends I made was to my friend Dave. And I know exactly where I was. I was in a supermarket in Vons. And I believe he called me out of nowhere. We hardly ever talked. We hadn't talked in quite a while. And he asked me how I was doing. And I took that chance. Because I had been working with a sponsor now on the steps. That time that I talked to him on the air, I had not had a sponsor. I had not even done the steps. But this was off the air. And this is quite a while later, uh, maybe in my second year of sobriety, he called me to see how I was doing. And I made amends right away. I humbly asked, listen. And I told him, this is why I'm doing this. It's part of my program. And I need to make sure that I can, what do I do to make things right? Uh, And, you know, a lot of people will be so glad and say, look, we're good or however they want to handle it. And here's the thing. There are so many stories. I remember once a guy had stolen some things from a store and he did that a lot. And when it was time to make amends years later, he went back to that store. He tracked the manager down. He says, what can I do to make it right? I I have some items written down that I believe that I remember I stole from you. Can I, can I give you some money? And the manager was so thrilled and impressed of his honesty that he said, we're good. However, when I tried to make amends to a certain person and this person had wanted nothing to do with me, I was told by my sponsor, you try three different times. Not like three days in a row, but three different times. And if that person will not accept your amends, well, you move on, unfortunately. You move on, and that's how it goes. You've done your best. So getting back to uh, uh, my earlier years of sobriety, it was great. I was still doing the uh, bill collecting thing, was which was not so great. <laughs> it really wasn't. And I got a chance, I got a phone call from a guy who, remember uh, episodes before when I told you that my dad wanted me to get into radio? He saw an ad in the newspaper called American Dream Broadcasting. Well, one of the guys that actually graduated from that school, (laughs) graduated, which I use in terms, he was now working in Fargo. He had a radio show out there with another guy. And man... When I was on my feet and I got out of recovery, I really wanted to get back into radio, but nobody would hire me. There were no jobs open, and I had tried to get back on the show I was with before, and and they had nothing, and I don't blame them. I mean, you know, look, that fantasy of me being accepted back with a red carpet and a, a Corvette pulling up to the house with a blonde coming out with a bunch of money and cigars, that fantasy was gone a long time ago. So this guy calls me out of nowhere in Fargo. He says, how'd you like to come out and be our producer? I said, really? And I thought about it. Fargo. Where the hell's Fargo? Oh, oh, Fargo, the movie. Fargo, North Dakota. So I weighed my options. And the people I lived with, they had uh, listened to my options. And they, they didn't want me to go because the pay was pretty low. They had said to me, why don't you just take another job out here and stay here? And man, I'll tell you what, San Diego is one of the most perfect cities in the world, as you know. And it's pretty tough to just say, yeah, because I had never moved. I had never lived anywhere else except when I was like in my late 20s, I moved to Boston for three months. But I had to come back because A, I was homesick and B, because it was so expensive. But this, we're talking this time about moving to Fargo. And uh, starting a a job in radio as a producer for a country. But here's another thing, for a country music station. And man, do I hate country music. <laughs> I really do. My dad, he loved it. And that's all he played around the kitchen with his guitar. So I thought about it. I thought, um, A, I can get out of bill collecting. B, I have to move. Uh, and see what's Fargo like. Well, I talked to, his name was Jim. I talked to Jim for 
a good long while and I accepted the job and he called me back and said, here's some information. We have a plane ticket for you. You'll be leaving in four days. So what did I do? I rented Fargo. <laughs> uh, that lasted about 10 seconds. Cause you've, if anybody who's seen Fargo, remember some of the opening scenes are s- lots of bad weather. In about 10 seconds, as I'm comfortably uh, sitting comfortably on my rear end in 70, 78 degrees of San Diego weather at home at this beautiful house, I'm 10 seconds in and I freeze frame the movie Fargo and I went, what the hell am I doing? Because remember, I already had a plane ticket. I had committed myself. So I jump on the plane. I get on a red eye. And for those of you that have ever flown a red eye, you know how wiped out that can make you for a day and a half or so. I take that flight. I end up in Minneapolis where the guy is going to pick me up with his whole family, who, by the way, the whole family had the flu. And that was fun. Hacking, hacking away in a station wagon. He picks me up and he's in shorts. And we walk outside and it's like 35 degrees. And I'm like, man, aren't you cold? He's like, actually, it's been pretty... He, it says to me, actually, it's been pretty warm the last uh, couple. Of, I look around and I see these big, huge Matterhorn Hill uh, mounds of big hills of snow in the parking lot. I'm like, what the? And I point over to the snow and he goes, oh, yeah, that, that'll that burn off around July or so. That'll burn off around June because I flew in on March. I'm, I'm coming up on 10 years out here. Can you believe it? I, I flew in in March and I land. And so uh, we're driving out to Fargo. And um, we finally get there, and uh, I meet uh, my roommate that agreed to take me in without even meeting me. It was a small, tiny little two-bedroom apartment. And there I am. I'm starting to live in Fargo. And the very first thing I told myself, the very first thing, is when I get settled and find the place I'm going to live at and put away my stuff, I am going to look up the closest and the nearest AA meeting. And you know what? It was literally about a quarter mile away. Not even that. It was across the street, across a big, huge parking lot, and it was at a Holiday Inn inside one of their dining rooms. And it was great. I walked into that room once again, what I said earlier, how I felt comfortable right from the start. There were about eight or nine guys in there. They all shook my hand. I told them who I was. They said, welcome. We sat down. Some of them ate. I just sat there and listened. And when they came to me, I told my story just briefly. And I said, wow, this is going to be awesome. I think we met on a Monday night. And I had stayed in Fargo almost a year. No, just over a year. But in that process, I was now at seven years sober. And uh, my friend Dave, who I had talked to, a little bit more and a little bit more and a little bit more. And he became uh, more trusting in me. And he uh, he he and I gathered our friendship. And uh, that became stronger and stronger again as, once again, as I, I earned back his trust. He was actually able to call through the speakerphone and give me my seven-year token which was just unbelievable. He had written this really nice note. He sent me this really cool token. And right around the seven or eight guys that are around the table, he gets on the speakerphone and he gives me my token. And it was, it was wonderful. It was a blast. Problem. I, uh, I didn't like, uh, I told you I didn't like country music and I felt stagnant at this radio station and I had given it at least a year for working there and I miss San Diego like crazy, of course. But during that time, I had said to my friend the pivotal question, "Uh, I need your advice. I'm not very happy here. Not because of the people I worked with, but because of the job. I was a producer and I really wanted to be on the air more. I, I I missed it so much before when I was on the show. And I asked him, he goes, well, what are the pros and cons? So I told him the pros and cons. 
and the cons of outweigh the pros. And he goes, if I were you, uh, he goes, if I were you, I would look around. And I did. The next morning, I did, boy. I looked around. And I, at that time, here's the cool thing. At that time in Fargo, one of the first things also I did in Fargo was contact KGB because uh, I was doing weekends because I was able to get my weekend shift back about a year and a half earlier before I moved to Fargo. I forgot to mention that. See, there's so many things sometimes you forget. And uh, they brought me back for uh, a chance to be on the weekend, and I was doing that for about a year and a half until I took this job in Fargo. And my worry was when I moved to Fargo, of course, was I going to find an I an iHeart radio station because that's where you needed to record your shift and then they it gets mapped out to San Diego. Did this is all this make sense? The problem was there was no iHeart radio station in Fargo, but there was in a place called Grand Forks. And Grand Forks was about eighty miles away from Fargo. So I would drive after I would work at this country music station in Fargo, I would drive to Grand Forks get in there and I was able to record my weekend shows for KGB. So the cool thing was now I was doing country as a producer and I kept my weekend shift in San Diego. Still, I was able to keep hang on to that, which was big for me as so. So my friend says, what are the pros and cons? I told him the cons. He said, look, if I were you, I'd look for a new job. So I turned around the next day and I called the, uh, the, the program director, at uh, Grand Forks, where I had to go once a week, and I said, "Look, uh, Brian, if there's anything that you can hear of, any anybody, anybody, anywhere that is looking for a morning show or looking for somebody, will you let me know?" And he got back with me, and he says, "As a matter of fact, Minot, Minot, North Dakota, spelled M-I-N-O-T, they are looking for a, a morning person." I said, "Oh, great! Do you know uh, who it is?" And he told me who it was. He says, "Can you get a hold of her?" He goes, "Yeah, I'll get." Send me an email. I go, can I do it right now? And I was I was so excited. So I sent him the information. He sent it to her. And she got back to me. And she said uh, she called me for an interview. And that was a 55-minute <laughs> interview. I wouldn't stop talking. I was so excited. I saw this vision of moving out to Minot. Now, I had never been to Minot before. So I'm still living in Fargo. I'm still working at the country music station, but I'm keeping my fingers crossed because now I got a chance, underline the chance part, to move to Minot to do mornings by myself. And boy, for about three weeks or so, it was agony. Wondering and worrying, will I get this job or not? And every once in a while she'd check in, just checking on you to see if everything's good. And I would analyze that text over and over again. What does that mean by that? Just checking. Just checking to see if you're all right. Does that mean if, if, if I'm all right, if I'm not drinking? Or And finally, she sends me a message the day before. Hey, will you be around at 4 o'clock tomorrow afternoon? I said, yes, 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 yes. So I called Dave up. And I go, what do you think that means? And he goes, well, A, it could mean that she's 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 really conscientious and she wants to call you and say, hey, look, great. Great that you applied, but I'm sorry, we moved on with someone else. Or B, you got the job. And man, did I worry. All that night into the next day, uh, did I get the job or not? And I was going crazy. And I remember going out to Grand Forks that afternoon to record my, it was a Friday. I went out there to record my weekend for San Diego. I get in the car as I'm leaving Grand Forks. She calls me and she says, listen, just want to let you you know you got the job. And that's all I heard. So take the weekend to, uh, to let me know if you want it. I said, I don't need the weekend. I want it. 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 (laughs) I got the job. I was so excited. It was one of the greatest days of my life. I got the job on my own. I couldn't believe it because I had tried to get other jobs before when I was living in San Diego. I had tried to get jobs around the country and I had interviews. Remember, I'm still thinking I'm a big shot, but that was slowly fading and all my interviews bombed. And but when I got this job in Minot, I couldn't believe it. I packed up my cat 
Her name is Felon, F-E hyphenated or that little dash L-O-N. You know what that spells? Felon. You know why I named her that? Because her old owner robbed a bank. And when he went to prison, the cat was left all by itself in an apartment. And they were going to take this cat to the pound. And the guy from the morning show on the countryside said, hey, you want a cat? I said, yeah, I do. So anyway, Felon and I, we moved to Minot. And I start working in this tiny little town. And I ended up working there for four years. And in that process, I found two places I would go for meetings. One of them actually allowed you to smoke inside. And I'll tell you how cool that was, lighting a big old cigar inside, about ready to share in this uh, cool little room downstairs. Lived there in Minot for four plus years, maybe just just past four years. I don't know how long it really was. And then I started doing my There Is A Way Out podcast because one day my boss, Allison, says, hey, they want us to start doing podcasts. And I go to her, I go, I don't know a thing about you. What do I talk about? Talk about pod, talk about me. And she goes, hey, why don't you talk about something you're, you believe in, something you feel strongly about? Recovery. And I looked at her and I went, that's a, man, that's a damn good idea. And she said, I know, that's why I said it. So I called it There Is A Way Out. And I racked up 30 of those podcasts. And then I got laid off. Like in January or whatever it was. I got laid off. And my podcast stopped because I recorded them in that radio station. I was lucky enough to get a Facebook message from somebody out here in Bismarck. His name's Rick. And he told me they were looking for somebody for Classic Rock to be a program director. And I knew where Bismarck was, but I had never been. I also knew Bismarck was not that far from mine, not about 100 miles away. So I applied and went through all that rigor and ran and keep... I got the job in Bismarck. Can you believe it? I came out here and I've been out here ever since. As a matter of fact, I'm a, if I get there, knock on wood, if I get there, I'm coming up on my four-year anniversary here in Bismarck on a classic rock station. Back then it was the Fox. Now it's called the Walleye. 96.5 the Walleye. And, of course, the first thing I did when I moved out here is find out where all the AA meetings were. Right around that time, COVID kicked in. And COVID, of course, put a halt to a lot of the places where you can go as you as you live through it and you knew you know about it. So I uh, hooked up on Zoom meetings or I did whatever I could and I missed my podcast. I tried to continue them on through my phone and that never worked out. I guess the greatest thing about my journey so far is that I'm able to share with others and I'm able to listen to others and this is what I miss and this is what I'm so looking forward to now. I'm so looking forward to my first guest. She's going to be on tomorrow. She's just flat out awesome. You'll hear about her. I want people to explore their feelings and I want people to share what they went through, their fears and 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 their highs and lows. I want people out that are listening to this to know that we all go through it. All, almost every single day, it doesn't matter what minute of your lifetime and it, and the triggers are enormous. There are triggers everywhere. And I believe that with my group page on Facebook, which by the way, I'm super proud of. And if you're listening to this and you're not a member of There Is A Way Out on our Facebook page, please send me an invite because I'm the administrator guy and I'm the one that clears people or all that stuff. And we have to do it because I'm telling you, I have had so many people try to get through to they're either selling shoes or this or that or the porno people who like to try to send their porno sites in. And I was able to figure out a way to nip that in the bud. So now if anybody sends me anything, I have to clear it first, which is fantastic. Anyway, it's called There Is A Way Out. It's a group page on Facebook. I want people to feel comfortable to be able to share. I don't want to just be the one that talks on this thing the whole time because I'm boring. And uh, I lose my train of thought sometimes I want people to talk about the steps so others can hear how the steps worked with them because everyone was different everyone went their own path their own journey different ways everyone has a story about how the steps worked for them what their favorite step was 12 of them of course the 12 steps 
of Alcoholics Anonymous. And we all have our own journey we're on. And the beautiful thing is we all have a say in our lives and we all have a meaning. And in, and each and every person that I'm going to have come on are so special to me and I want them to be special to you. And this is why I can't wait to share. Can't wait to share. There is a way out with others, with other people who will speak. And that'll happen tomorrow. Once again, my name is Bromo. There is a way out. If you're feeling like maybe you've hit rock bottom, if you know of somebody who thinks they've they've gone astray and hit rock bottom, I hope you listen in. Thank you for your time. There is a way out. Hey, guys, time to get in on the action for the biggest moments in basketball with Prize Picks, America's number one fantasy sports app. Just select two or more players, pick more or less on their projections, place your entry, and win up to 100 times your money. Right now, Prize Picks will match your first deposit of up to $100. Just download the Prize Picks app and use the code GET100. That's code GET100 on Prize Picks for a first deposit match of up to $100. Prize Picks, pick more, pick less. It's that easy.